During the course of my life, especially in my school-aged years, I have heard and I have sung Canada's national anthem many, many times. Um, how many people remember your school days of singing the national anthem every morning? I, I, I like the Olympics, too, when a Canadian wins a gold medal and they play the national anthem. I, just, I, I really like Canada's national anthem, and that's probably because... I've been born and raised in Canada. I love, I love the country. Um, it's a good place to live, and uh, I love the anthem. But it wasn't until a few years ago that I learned that the anthem we sing is not how it was originally composed in English. It actually started out as a French song, and then in 1908, a man by the name of Robert Stanley Weir uh, composed this in English in 1908, which later became our national anthem. I, there are four verses uh, to the song. I, I'm going to read them all for you as, as Robert Stanley Weir originally wrote them. So just listen here to the words of O Canada. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love, thou dost in us command. We see thee rising fair, dear land, the true north strong and free. We stand on guard for thee, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. And then you have the uh, chorus, which is, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Here's verse 2. O Canada, where pines and maples grow, great prairies spread and lordly, lordly rivers flow. How dear to us thy broad domain from east to western sea. Thou land of hope for all who toil, thou true north strong and free. Here's verse 3. O Canada, beneath thy shining skies may stalwart sons and gentle maidens rise to keep thee steadfast through the years from east to western sea, our own beloved native land, our true north, strong and free. Now here's verse 4. Really listen to verse 4. Ruler supreme, who hearest humble prayer, Hold our dominion within thy loving care. Help us to find, O oh God, in thee a lasting, rich reward, awaiting, as, as waiting for the better day we ever stand on guard. Imagine singing that fourth verse in public school today. How would that go over? It's a reminder to me, as I, uh, as I read those words, it's a reminder to me of our nation's history. A history where, at least for much of our, and especially in the earlier days, God had at least some place of honor in our public institutions, whether it be in our courts or in our politics or in our schools. God had some kind of place there. I don't have to tell you that those days are over. And they've been over for some time. In fact, we now live in a time where there's politicians, I think this happened a year or two ago, where politicians were lob lobbying to have God removed from our national anthem altogether. There is a, there is a desire, it seems, in the midst of Canadian life to have God removed from not only our national anthem, but every fabric of the public domain. We now live in a time where most people know the name of Jesus as a curse word rather than acknowledging Him as Lord. Now it may be of some encouragement to us, I hope it's of some encouragement to us, to know that the church of Christ has lived through times like this before. This is not new territory that we've entered, to, entered into in Canada, and to be honest, it's really not even all that bad yet in terms of persecution of the church, but these are places where the church has been before. Times where the power people in society, the people who are in control, would rather wipe away the name of Jesus than honor Him. 
In our text this morning, there's a strong contrast that Mark draws between those who want to get rid of Jesus. That, those are the people we meet first. They, they want to do away with the, Him. They want to take Him off the scene. There's a contrast between those kinds of people. And then there is the contrast between people who want to give Jesus the highest place of honor in their hearts and minds. Throughout history, throughout the history of the church, this contrast has been present this is, this is normal for the church of Christ. And it certainly is present today. Now my presumption is, by the fact that you're attending here this morning, uh, that most of you, maybe this is not true of all of you, but my, my presumption is that many or most of us here want to be the sorts of people that give honor to the name of Jesus. They give honor to Christ in our lives. Those are the sorts of people that we want to be. So if that's you, then turn in your Bible with me to Mark chapter 14. We're looking at verses 111 1 through 11 this morning. And in these verses, there are three important lessons for us as people who want to honor Christ. Lesson number one is this. Honoring Jesus is costly. The degree of worth that we ascribe to Christ in our hearts directly determines the amount we're willing to give for His sake. Honoring Jesus is costly. Mark reminds us here in the first two verses that the time of Jesus' trial is at hand. You see that there in verse 1. It says, Now Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. Now we know, uh, well, if you've never been to church before, you may not know this, but many of us will know that that's the time when Jesus dies on the cross at Calvary. Now we're told another bit of information here in these first couple verses that the chief priests and teachers of the law are looking for a sly way. Did you catch that word? A sly way at the end of verse 1 to arrest Jesus and have Him killed. In other words, they don't care how they do it. They don't need to be honest. They don't need to have any integrity. They just want Him gone. But they say there, Mark tells us, that they don't want to do that during the feast or else the people might riot. They're afraid of creating too much of a commotion. So we want to arrest him. We want to put him to death, but we'll wait till after the feast. Why does Mark put that in there for us? That little bit of information. I think it's a subtle reminder that God is in charge of this situation. See, the, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they want to wait till after the feast to put Jesus, to arrest him and put him to death. But that's not what happens, is it? In fact, what happens is that just two days from where, where we are in the text, just two days from this very day, Jesus is going to be arrested, he's going to be put on trial, and he's going to be killed. And he's going to be killed during the Passover feast. That's a reminder that God is in control of this situation. Now if you go back in your minds to the Old Testament, if you've been doing a yearly reading plan, you probably have read this already in the book of Exodus, where the first Passover takes place. Do you remember all the imagery there? Here's the nation of Israel, and they're where? They're in Egypt. And they're in slavery. They, they, they're, they're in bondage. They're, they're trapped in the nation of Israel. They can't go anywhere. And then God raises up this man, this, uh, uh, this uh, we would have probably chosen a better person for the job than Moses. He, he was uh, kind of shy and he didn't really like to talk in, in public and he had all, all kinds of problems. But God raises up this man, Moses, and he frees the people of Israel out of Egypt, right? And then, and then they celebrate the Passover feast as a commemoration, you're supposed to eat a bread without leaven or without yeast in it as a reminder of the urgency, the quickness with which the people of Israel were delivered from the nation of Israel or from the nation of Egypt. Now, there's a lot of parallel there in what happens with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're in slavery. Every single human person that's ever been born is in slavery to their sin. And God, like He raised up a deliverer, a, a rescuer for the people of Israel, He raises up a rescuer, a deliverer for all people in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul refers to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 5, 
or 2 Corinthians 5, he refers to Jesus as our Passover lamb. So here you have the people who, want, who are ultimately going to work their, uh, work their evil to have Jesus arrested and put to death, but they want to do it at a different time, and God says, no, 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 no. This is going to happen at the Passover feast because I want everybody to know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover. He's the ultimate fulfillment of the Passover. He's the one that ultimately sets us free from the slavery of sin. God is in control of all this. Now, their hatred is their own. God did not force them to hate Jesus. He did not force them to want to kill them. That's all their own. And then we get this powerful contrast here. So that's, that's what Mark tells us in the first two verses. There's these people who want Jesus dead. And then we read this in verse 3. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man named Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Mark tells us a few things in this verse. First of all, he tells us that Jesus is in Bethany, which is a small town, kind of like a suburb of Jerusalem, and that's where Jesus goes. Every day he teaches in the temple, and when he's done teaching and ministering, he returns back to Bethany. And it's important for us to see a few things here. Number one, what's happening in this moment? Do you see that at the beginning of the verse here? We're told that Jesus is reclining at the table. Now what do you do when you uh, sit down at the table at your house? You must all be hungry this morning. All right? We eat. When we go to the table, we eat. So here, Jesus is gathered in this house for a meal. That's the reason why you get together at the table is to eat. That's the same thing. The same thing is true here. Another important bit of information here is this is happening in the house of a man named Simon the leper. Now, how many of you know your Bibles well enough to know that leprosy is a bad thing? Right? You, you don't want to handle Mike the leper. <laughs> that, that is not a good name to go by. The reason why he's called Simon the leper, there has to be one of two reasons. There's only one of two conceivable reasons this man is called Simon the leper. Either number one, he currently has leprosy, or number two, he had leprosy at some point in his life and he's now healed. Now if you know your Bible... Uh, if you know your Levitical rules on skin diseases, you want some light reading this afternoon, just flip through Leviticus and get some rules on skin diseases, then you know that what God required, when somebody comes down with leprosy, what God required is that for that person to be completely separated from all other people. They, had to, they couldn't live in their home anymore. They had to be uh, removed from the city. And oftentimes in the ancient world, you would find what's called leper colonies, is that people with leprosy would gather and they would make kind of a shanty town outside of, uh, outside of cities. So I think that knowing that, knowing the biblical requirements for, for leprosy, and knowing that they're gathering in Simon's house for a meal, the most logical conclusion here is that Simon has been healed from leprosy. Now, who do you think did that? Jesus is the one that's healed this man. Now, something else that's important to know about the ancient world when, when people gathered for meals is that when they, when they gathered for meals, there would be seating arrangements for people to sit. And there were places that were considered more honorable than others. And so, if you're giving a meal or a banquet... Now, now, now to put yourself in Simon the leper's shoes here, and, and, and of course, we're, we're assuming that I'm right in, in, in my analysis of this situation, but he has had leprosy, and he's been healed by Jesus. Who is the guest of honor at this meal? Jesus would be the guest of honor at this meal, right? And, and, and one thing that's important for us to keep in mind here is that when a person is a guest of honor in the ancient world in this sort of context, what would often happen is their head would be anointed with oil. It was a sign of showing honor or praise or adoration for the guest of honor. Now all of that goes into what we read here and what, that, what this unnamed woman does. She takes this jar and she 
pours perfume, and it's, and it's not the kind of perfume that we would think of today where it's more of a liquidy. This is more of an oily type perfume, and she pours it on Jesus' head. Why does she do it? She does it because she wants to put the honor of Christ on display. Mark makes a big deal of the particular kind of oil that she used. Common oil of the day was olive oil. That was the everyday oil that you would use for uh, cooking and, for, and, and often for anointing your head. You would use olive oil, but that's not the kind of oil she uses. Mark makes a big deal of it. He, look, he says she came with an alabaster jar. Now this alabaster jar would have been a, a small jar. It would hold about a pint of liquid and it would have a long neck on the top of it and it would be permanently sealed. That's important, permanently sealed. Now the reason why you have a permanently sealed jar is because you want to preserve the scent of the oil that's on the inside. If you just left it to the open air, the, the scent that it would eventually dissipate, so they sealed it permanently. It wasn't like there was a screw-on lid here that you could open up. This was, this was a sealed deal, and it was for a one-time shot. And oftentimes what you would find in this particular case is that because it's so expensive, you would actually have this jar of perfume uh, handed down from generation to generation. It was, it was often used as a kind of like a family heirloom. You know, everybody knows what's inside the jar, but everybody knows you never, ever open it, right? Do you have things like that at your house, like fine china that you never use, and like a family heirloom that just sits in a vacuum-sealed container never to be touched, right? That's the sort of scene that we have here. We're told that it's, this oil is made of pure nard. Uh, that is a, that, that is a oil that's extracted from a root of a plant that grows in India, and so it came from a great distance, and it's not easy to produce. Thus, it is extremely expensive. And it's in this sealed jar to preserve it, to make sure that it, it keeps its value. And here's Jesus sitting at the table, eating a meal. Likely the guest of honor. And she wants to honor Him to the maximum capacity that she is able to. So she comes to Christ with this jar of extremely expensive scented oil. She snaps the neck off it. That's what it says here, that she breaks the jar. She broke the jar, end of verse 3. And she poured it, likely the whole thing, all of it, on Jesus' head. Now, why does Mark make such a big deal about the expense of it? And actually, in the next verse, we'll see that he comes back to the, how expensive it truly is. Why does he make a big deal of it? It, it? This is the reason. Because the value of the perfume is a way of communicating the worth that this woman placed on Jesus. We know that that's true. You can't escape. You cannot separate the value of the gift from the value that you inherently place on the person you're giving the gift to, right? We know that the value of a gift relative to a person's purchasing power is a display of the worth that they place upon the person. Flowers are a perfect example of this. How, how many people like getting flowers from time to time? Come on, guys. Anybody? No? Well, I, I know the women were putting up their hand. I was... Expecting at least one guy, no? Flowers are a perfect example of this. Just imagine a little kid, like a, a two- or a three-year-old kid, spends some of their afternoon playing time gathering dandelions. And they, they put it in a little bunch, and then they come in the house, and they say, Mommy, they, they never do this for the dads. Um, they say, Mommy, these are for you. Doesn't that just, like moms, doesn't that just melt your heart? Don't you just love that? Don't you just feel like treasured and valued by your little kid? They have no ability to go to the store and buy roses. They're just doing the best they can with their little dandelions and they bring it to their mom, right? And it's just this expression of how much they love their mother. Now imagine the husband does that. Just, was up mowing the lawn, dear? 
And, uh, you know, I was thinking of you. Here you go. Dandelions. How's that one going to go over? Right? You see? So, so relative to our purchasing power, there is something inherent about the value, the monetary value of a gift that communicates something about the worth that we're placing on the person. That's why Mark makes such a big deal of the cost of this. Because that's the reality. We are saying something about the honor and worth we are placing on the one we are trying to honor with the amount of personal cost involved in the gift that's being displayed. We see this illustrated in the Old Testament sacrificial system where God says, you remember? God tells them what kind of animals to bring. He says, bring the good ones. Bring the ones without defect. Bring the ones that are are perfect, or at least the appearance of being good. Bring the best stuff to me to sacrifice, God says. Don't bring the sick ones. Don't bring the diseased ones. Bring the good ones. And then, of course, the people of Israel who have a real problem with obeying the Lord, they try and bring the sick and diseased animals to God as sacrifices. And we read in Malachi chapter 1, verse 8, where God, is, where, where God is rebuking them for this practice. And he says, try and do that with your governor. Like, try and do that with the local mayor. Try and bring him a diseased animal as, a, as, a, as an offering. You think he's going to be, or uh, to pay your tax. You think he's going to be satisfied with that? Of course, we know the answer is he would not be satisfied. It's interesting to me how often we want to give God as little as possible. Here's, here's an animal, here's a sheep that's, uh, that's got a disease or sickness. You know what we should do? Let's go offer it to God because we can't use it anyway. It's amazing to me how often we give God as little as possible, but can I tell you that it's noticeable? It's noticeable. It's it's perceivable. It's obvious how little we think of Christ because we give Him so very little. And conversely, it's obvious if if you give Jesus much, it's obvious how much you care about Him. This woman puts on full display her high view of Christ by pouring this extremely expensive scented oil. Who knows how long this jar had been in her family. And she gives it to Christ to honor Him. He's the guest of honor worthy of such a great gift. And the moment she cracks that, the moment she cracks the neck of that jar and begins to pour out the scent, everybody in that room knew exactly what she had done. And she knew the, then they knew the cost of what she had done. Immediately, as soon as the scent fills the room, and immediately people react to what she's done. And some of them get rather vocal about uh, their analysis of what has just taken place, and they're rather negative about the whole thing. And the reaction teaches us a second important lesson about honoring the Lord. First, honoring Jesus is costly. Second, criticism, is often, criticism often comes when we honor Jesus. Some people, even believers, even people who claim to follow Christ, will question radical actions that are done on account of devotion to our Lord. Criticism often comes when we honor Jesus. Keep in mind that most of the people present in the room are followers of Jesus. Like, Jesus' disciples are in the room. I mean, we can understand unbelievers thinking that we have lost our marbles when we treasure Jesus to the point of making radical decisions for Him. But believers? Like, believers should get it, right? And yet, this is what we read in verses 4 and 5. Some of those present were saying indignantly, That's a fancy way of saying that they were mad about this. They were upset. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Like she gets a tongue lashing here. 
We're given a clearer sense of the value of the scented perfume here when, it, when, when it's labeled as a year's wages. Just for curiosity's sake, I looked up on Statistics Canada what the average wage was in Canada in 2018. It was $55,806 was the average wage in Canada. Now that may not be completely fair to compare the year's wage in Canada to a year's wage in the ancient world. So let's just for argument's sake play it on the conservative side and cut that number in half to 27,500 bucks. Imagine paying 30 grand, nearly 30 grand for a little jar of perfume about this big. Imagine that. That's a ton of cash, right? Like, I, I doubt that there's anybody here that owns a bottle of perfume like that. It's a ton of cash. And she pours it all, all of it, on Jesus' head. Now, the immediate thought of some in the room is that that should not have happened, right? There's no way she should have done this. They're beside themselves thinking that a huge amount of money has just been wasted. And they're actually angry about it, it says, and they rebuke her harshly. They're, you should not have done this. So instead of seeing this as a magnificent display of honoring Jesus, that Jesus is worthy of this incredibly valuable gift, and He is worthy, completely worthy, of the highest honor and praise, right? He is. Instead of seeing it as that, they see it as a frivolous and immoral act. They put on a real self-righteous display here saying they sh that should have been sold and given to the poor. Now, they're right to care about the poor. I mean, Jesus talked to, talks about that all the time. They're right to care about the poor, but they're wrong to think that this honoring of Jesus is in any way hinders their ability to care for the poor. Let me ask you a question. How much money did it cost Jesus to feed the 5,000? How much money did it cost him to feed 4,000 people just a few weeks later? Zero. God's ability to provide is unlimited, right? God cares about the poor. Jesus wants us to strive to look after them, but we can do those things, we can do those things without any love for Christ in our hearts. There's a long list of atheists that think it's important to care for the poor. They care nothing for Jesus. And what good is that? What people need most from Christians is an outward display of an inward desire to honor Jesus as our most glorious King. That's what people need most. Oftentimes, those sort of things look foolish to people outside, to people around us, and sometimes they look foolish to believers. One of the greatest missionary stories of the 20th century is when five missionaries named Jim Elliott, Nathan Saint, Roger Yodarian, Ed McCauley, and Pete Fleming. They were killed in Ecuador in 1956 trying to bring the gospel to an unreached people group there. Some people thought that they were fools. Some people thought that you know, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't even be missionaries, just stay in North America and be pastors. They thought they were foolish for doing what they did. What's even more amazing about that story is that after their husbands were killed, some of the wives go back to the same tribe that killed their husbands and they go back to share the Gospel with them. And most of that tribe, if not all of the tribe, came to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. But there were a lot of people who looked at that and, and thought, that's just foolish. That's just dumb. You shouldn't do that. More recently... Just last year, you may have seen this story in the news, a missionary named John Allen Cho was killed trying to make contact with an isolated, unreached people group. And after he died, lots of people questioned his actions. There was tons of criticism to go around. Maybe some of that criticism was justified. But my question is, what drove those guys? 
What drove these people to go to the ends of the earth to share the gospel with people who never heard the name of Jesus? What does that? It's a love for Jesus. They love and honor Christ so much that they're willing to give up their life for the cause of Christ. Only, only a love for Jesus desires to honor Him. Only a love for Jesus will motivate us paying uh, extreme costs for the sake of His glory. And when we're willing to pay those costs, when we love Christ to such a degree, there are going to be people who criticize and question those choices. I want to issue a word of caution here. Just because you're criticized does not automatically mean that you love and honor Christ. Right? People make foolish choices all the time for selfish reasons that have nothing to do with the Lord. If you buy a big screen TV on a credit card, even though you can't afford it, that's just being foolish. And if somebody says that's foolish, they're not criticizing you because you love Jesus. They're criticizing you because you're bad with money. Right? On the other hand, giving up a good job in North America giving up an easy life here to live halfway around the world to be part of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth is a clear demonstration of your love and delight in the King of Kings. Now people may say to you, it's not safe to go there. People may say to you, how can you move so far away from your family? People may say to you all kinds of things. They may criticize you in all kinds of ways. We live in a land where we can easily spend all that we make on ourselves. But what motivates a person to live beyond, below the standard of living that they could actually afford so that they could send money to support a missionary who's given up everything here to live halfway across the world? It's honoring Jesus. It's loving Jesus. Here's a question to think about. When we look back on our time of following Jesus, are there examples, can you think of examples in your life where other people think that you've taken your faith for Christ a little bit too far? Have we ever been criticized for doing or saying something because of our devotion to Christ? Do people envy us because we have achieved what the world desires or do they think that we're fools because we give this life away? If we have never been criticized for our actions that are motivated by a desire to honor Jesus, we have to ask ourselves, how much do we really think of Jesus? How much do we really honor Him? Honoring Jesus is costly. And when we gladly pay the cost of honoring Christ, there are going to be those around us that think we are fools, that think we should do things differently, that think we should be more practical in life. Those can be difficult moments, especially when it comes from people who are close to you, a close family member or a close friend. When someone says that you're wasting your life or that you're being foolish, it can cause us to rethink our choices. Maybe we shouldn't go here and do this. Maybe we shouldn't send money here or to that place. Jesus, though, gives us good reason here to remain steadfast in remaining devoted to Him. Here's the third thing that we need to keep in mind. Is that Jesus vindicates everyone who honors Him. You want to honor Jesus? That's costly. It's going to cost you something to honor him in the same way this woman honors him here at the banquet. You're going to honor Jesus? You can expect to be criticized. People will think you've lost your rocker. Or you've, you, well, how's that? You're off your rocker. That's the, uh, that's the phrase. People think you're off your rocker, right? But here's the most important thing. Jesus vindicates everyone who honors him. Without exception, the Lord will show that giving him his proper place in our lives is the wisest course of action that we could ever take. Jesus quickly puts an end to the criticism here in verses 6 and 9. They're trying to 
you know, give her a hard time. And here's what Jesus says at the beginning of verse 6. Leave her alone. That's a command, not a suggestion. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. If Jesus had wanted to stop her from breaking the jar and pouring the perfume on him, he could have done that. But he doesn't. He could have said, no, no, I know what you're about to do. Don't do that. Let's sell the perfume and give the money to to the poor. He could have done that. But he doesn't. Those in the room who are so quick to jump all over this woman and criticize her, those in the room could have waited for Jesus to react to what had happened. But instead, they rush to judgment and rebuke her. Thankfully, this is, a good, this is good news for all of us, Jesus always has the final word. It's not the criticism of your family and friends that's going to be the final say in your life. It's going to be what Jesus says. That's going to be the final word in your life. And rather than joining those rebuking the woman, He silences them. Leave her alone. He says, She has done a beautiful thing or a good thing to me. This woman treasures Christ, whereas those rebuking her seem to take Jesus for granted. It's hard to say how much the woman understood about exactly what she was doing or how much she understood about what would happen just a matter of of two days from this event where Jesus is going to the cross. It's hard to know how much she understood, but what's clear is Jesus knew what was coming and he he calls this an anointment or uh, he, he says it's a way of preparing for his burial. Now, we would be mistaken to think that Jesus here is saying to his disciples that they shouldn't care about the poor or that the poor are unimportant when he says you always have the poor. His point here is for them to see the preciousness of this moment. Just two days from then, he's going to go to the cross. Here they are in this room and the Son of God is sitting at the same table as them and sharing a meal together. This woman has just heaped praise and devotion upon Him. The praise and devotion that He is most worthy of. And they miss it completely. Within hours, Jesus is going to be taken and He's going to be executed. And while they will know the joy of the resurrection, Jesus will be raised from the dead. He doesn't doesn't end in death. But He ascends into heaven a short time later. And until they themselves go to glory, or Jesus returns, there is going to be a separation between them and Christ. That's what He means. You're not always going to have Me with you. You ever have moments of regret in your life? I wonder how often they looked back on their time with Jesus and wished they had appreciated Him more than they did. This woman can look back on this moment with joy for her whole life. She has no regret. She is never going to regret such a great display of love and devotion for Christ. She's never going to regret that. In fact, Jesus makes a point of having this moment recorded in the Word of God so that her act of honoring Him would be known by the church throughout the history of the church until Jesus comes back. We hear this woman's story of honoring Jesus. While others look down on her, Jesus vindicates her. She has done a good thing. She has done a beautiful thing. And that... That, brothers and sisters, is a promise that everyone who honors Jesus with their life can believe in. That Jesus will vindicate those choices. A great illustration of this in the Bible is Noah. Here's Noah. God comes to him and says, look, there's going to be a flood. Build a boat. Have you ever thought about the resources involved in building the ark? 
you, you just take a trip on down to Kentucky sometime where they've built a life-size replica of this and just see how big the thing is and just realize, like, Noah invested a ton of resources into the boat, into the ark. It was costly for him. It took Noah somewhere between, God tell, when God tells him that the flood is coming to the time the flood comes, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 years. How much criticism do you think Noah faced in those hundred years? Building a boat in the middle of land, not just a small boat, right? But a giant boat. How much criticism do you think Noah faced in those years? Probably quite a few, probably quite a bit. But on the day the rains come and God closes the door, God vindicates Noah. You could think of a story from the early church. I've shared it before. A young woman named Perpetua. She was in prison, awaiting to be executed for following Jesus, and her father comes to her. He says, please, just offer the sacrifice. Just burn the incense. You don't have to actually believe it. You can still trust Jesus as Lord. You, you, you don't have to believe it in your heart. Just do it on the outside so that you can live. Think of me. Think of your baby. Your 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 six-month or one-year-old baby. Think of them. Offer the sacrifice. She doesn't. She goes to the arena and she's mauled to death by animals. And in the moment she breathes her last and she's present with Christ, her choice is vindicated. We look at these things, we look at these examples of people honoring God, and it's understandable that, that, that unbelievers look at it and say, man, those people are crazy, they're foolish. Sometimes even believers say that, but Jesus always has the final word. So Jesus says to us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, don't store up for yourself treasure in the earth where moth and rust destroy. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy destroy I think a question that we all have to wrestle with in the face of this woman's example is how is our heavenly bank account doing how's that going has being a Christian cost you anything at all anything how many people have looked at you funny or criticized you for striving to honor the Lord well, I tell you, be encouraged if they have. You, you should actually, you know, not that we look for persecution or are happy when people give us a hard time, but there is a sense in which that should make us happy because the day of vindication is coming. Jesus has the final word. Don't make the same mistake that Judas makes here. Look at, look at how Judas reacts. Verses 10 and 11, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. He was face to face with Christ. Sat at the same table. Enjoyed fellowship with Him. And instead of delighting in Him and honoring His name, he joins his enemies. He betrays the Lord for money. Some, some commentators think that the, this moment when, when this woman breaks the jar and she pours the oil on Jesus' head and, and, and Jesus says, this is not a waste. This was a good thing to do. Some people think that's the moment when Judas decided to betray Jesus. Because, like, what about all that money? We learn in John's Gospel that Judas was actually stealing money from the money bag. Face to face with Christ. And he decides to pursue the treasure of this world rather than the honor of the name Jesus. It is our lack of affection for Christ that causes our failure to honor Him. 
That's what causes it. You want to know why you fail, why I fail to honor Jesus as much as we should? is because we don't love Him nearly enough. No one here has ever been guilty of the charge of loving Jesus too much. No one here has ever been guilty of the charge of giving to Jesus too much. No one has ever entered into glory, into the presence of Christ, wishing they had given Jesus less. It's never happened. Because to Him belongs the highest honor and praise, both now and forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, this woman whom is unnamed in Mark's text here is an incredible example of displaying love for the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I confess in my own heart this text is of great conviction to, to, to face the reality of my small affection for You and for the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, I pray. We, we can't... If it's up to us in our own sinful nature, Lord, we're, we're never going to increase our love for You. And so I pray that as we strive, as we, as we strive in Your Word, as we strive together as a church in worship, that You would be pleased to, 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 to pour out the power of the Holy Spirit in, in each one of us to give us a deeper affection and a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that the world would just think that we are crazy because we love Jesus so much. And we, we pray that that would happen, Lord, not, not only uh, for our good and the good of others, but for the glory of the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.